Great, thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, quick question. How do I advance slides? Okay. How do I make the slide work? Oh. Um, oh, okay. Is that what you yeah, okay. yeah, I, uh, all right, cool. All right. All right, awesome, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back from lunch. Um, and uh, it's great to be here. Um, great introduction, but uh, I am now a cannabis industry attorney. And yes, it's a real thing, um, which I, I guess is why some of you are here. Uh, just show of hands, how many attorneys in the audience? Okay, wow, a majority. How many non-attorneys? All right, <laughs> two. All right, don't worry, it's going to be fun. You're going to love it. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, Steve, uh, our host, has asked me uh, to talk about uh, marijuana law. And I think the best way to understand the current state of the law is to look at it historically. You know, it's like uh, the Oliver Wendell Holmes quote, uh, a page of history is worth a volume of logic. Um, so we'll just uh, jump right in. Um, you know, as you can see from the slide, you know, uh, hemp cultivation's been in North America since before the United States was even founded. Uh, I mean, going back to the seven, early 17th century. In fact, I just saw on, on NPR uh, last month, they've started growing hemp at Mount Vernon again. Um, evidently, there's a garden, and they grow all the plants that were grown on the property at, during George Washington's uh, time there. And in the early 20th century, they discontinued growing hemp, um, which we'll see why in a couple minutes. But uh, they've just recently started uh, to, to grow hemp at George Washington's old house. So uh, um, cannabis has been in, in North America for a long time. And in the, in the mid-19th century, up until the early 20th century, it was used medicinally. Um, you know, in spastic conditions, which they, that's what they called them back then. I guess today we, we would call them maybe seizure disorders or epilepsy. Um, headaches, labor pains. Um, any mothers in the audience? Could you maybe have used a little bit of weed in labor? Don't answer that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, it was used as medicine. And um, there was no significant uh, use of marijuana as an intoxicant until the, the early 1900s. Um, you know, traditionally, Americans, that is, that is to say, uh, uh, the peoples who came over and displaced the Native Americans from, you know, England, France, Spain, etc., uh, you know, especially the English, because the English ended up winning uh, the colonial war for North America, um, you know, they drank, uh, they drank wine, um, they drank beer, they drank rum, they drank whiskey. Um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, marijuana starts making an appearance. In, in, in North America. It was coming up uh, through New Orleans um, and, and Houston, port cities, where you know, uh, it was coming from the Caribbean. Sailors were bringing it up to the uh, southern port towns of the US. And then also um, in Mexico, um, uh, Mexican people were bringing it up across the Rio Grande River into Texas. Um, and so Texas. Um, Oh, uh, just a, a note here, um, I don't have footnotes in my slides because no one wants to read footnotes in a slide, but if anyone has any, uh, is curious about where I got any of this information, uh, you know, shoot me an email, I'd be happy to, to give you my, uh, my, uh, my source on this. Um, so just sort of, in, in your head, imagine there's a footnote there, especially where there's quotes, because there's some, there's some nasty language, which didn't come from me, <laughs> but... Uh, um, stay tuned for that. We got, oh, you wait till we get to the part about Richard Nixon. It's going to knock your socks off. But um, the very first um, cannabis law, marijuana law, that I was able, able to find comes from uh, El Paso, Texas, 1914. So again, you know, you've got marijuana coming up from Mexico, from the Caribbean, into the southern United States. I don't think it's an accident that your first uh, marijuana law in the U.S. came from El Paso, Texas. And the rationale for this law was the belief that marijuana caused violent and criminal behavior among, quote, Mexicans, Negroes, prostitutes, pimps, and a criminal class of whites. All right, so, um, you know, you can imagine, you know, the straight white community down in El Paso, you know, they were, they were drinking rye whiskey, but oh my God, you know, we've got all these, uh, all these undesirables, these, these, these invaders, these white trash, these ethnic minorities, they're smoking weed and it's bad. So we have to stop that. Um, but that was the rationale that carried, the rationale rather, that carried the day. Um, the next year, uh, the federal government gets involved. 
So the Treasury Department issues an administrative decision prohibiting the importation of cannabis for non-medical purposes. Um, a couple years later, uh, U.S. Congress passed the Narcotic Drug Import and Export Act, which made possession, uh, uh, drug possession, excuse me, um, a federal crime. So another thing that the, uh, now, so, so this act, now this slide shows how the, uh, the federal drug bureaucracy changed. And um, so just to go back one, Drug Import and Export Act. Um, what that act also did is it established the Federal Narcotics Control Board. Now that board changed names over the years. So it became the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, later it was the Bureau of Drug Control, later Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, and finally, uh, to its present incarnation, the Drug Enforcement Administration. And what I want you to notice here is, look at the departments that have had uh, jurisdiction over drug policy. It starts off in the Treasury Department, it later moves to Health, Education, and Welfare. That's now Health and Human Services because education got spun out during the Carter administration. Um, and then it finally ends up in the Justice Department where it is right now. Um, so we've gone from Treasury to Health to uh, law enforcement with respect to uh, federal uh, drug policy. Um, speaking of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, anybody heard of this guy? Anybody know who he is? All right, this guy is uh, responsible almost single-handedly for making weed illegal in the United States. Uh, his name is, was Harry J. Anslinger. He was the commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics from 1930 to 1962. He's like, like how J. Edgar Hoover uh, uh, really formed and shaped the FBI. That's what Anslinger did to, uh, with, uh, with uh, drug policy, and, and in particular, uh, marijuana. So... His initial uh, campaign was for the Uniform State Narcotics Drug Act. So remember, this is, this is the 1930s. This is before the New Deal. Um, you know, the way American government was understood, you just couldn't pass an omnibus overreaching federal law. Um, the states had a lot more political power uh, in, in the pre-New Deal era. So... Um, what Anslinger did is he and his allies campaigned all around the United States to lobby the states to pass their, the, the Uniform State Narcotics Drug Act. And the film Reefer Madness, you guys ever, I, like when I was in high school, MTV used to show it as a goof. You guys ever seen that movie? Yeah, check, check it out. I, I think you can find it on YouTube. It's, uh, it's crazy. You know, they, they show people getting high and then just acting crazy just, you know, engaging in sex and violence and just losing their minds. Um, well, that, that film was part of Henry Anslinger's campaign in favor of the states passing the Uniform State Narcotics Drug Act, um, which many states did, criminalizing marijuana at the state level. Um, in 1937, um, there were some changes in case law. There was a, a, there was a case involving automatic firearms in which the U.S. Supreme Court ratified the idea of a prohibitive tax, um, where you know you could take an activity and just tax the heck out of it, and the idea was that no one was going to be able to pay the tax, so they couldn't engage in that activity. And so this was challenged with respect to automatic weapons, like you know, think about you know Elliot Ness, the Untouchables with the Tommy guns. That's what this what, what this case was about. And uh, SCOTUS said, hey, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, for you non-lawyers, uh, SCOTUS said, hey, you know, you can do that. You can have a prohibitive tax. Um, and so um, the very next year, Anslinger and his allies said, okay, we'll do the same thing on marijuana. So they passed the Marijuana Tax Act, 1937. Just as, as a side note, uh, Timothy Leary, the Harvard professor who used to drop acid with his students, um, in, he got this Marijuana Tax Act to overturn about 30 years later. But anyway... Um, the point is, uh, you've got, again, throughout the 30s, you've got state and federal uh, governments criminalizing uh, marijuana uh, through every which way. And um, each of these prohibitions was based upon the criminality theory, um, which also included addiction and sanity. Again, going, going back to El Paso, um, 1914. You know, all these, all these undesirables, these lowlifes are smoking weed and acting crazy and becoming criminal. So um, we good upstanding people have to stop this. So um, 
Things go on through the, through the 1930s. By the time you get to the 40s, the addiction, insanity, and criminality theories fell out of favor. And those theories were replaced with the gateway drug theory. Um, and that theory holds that marijuana is a gateway to cocaine, morphine, heroin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I was born 1970, so this is the theory that I was raised with. You know, it's like you know, you, you smoke a joint today, and you know, inevitably you'll be shooting heroin uh, in the future. Um, and and what's what's uh, what I find interesting about this theory is it's one of these things that sound like it should be true. Okay, like. I don't think anybody, you know, starts with cocaine, although maybe they do, or, or, but, you know, it, it, it just seems like it should be true, but um, put a pin in that, we'll get back to it. Um, in any event, back in the 40s, um, scientists believed it. You know, marijuana's a gateway drug to all these other bad drugs and social ruin. Um, so the laws changed to reflect this, uh, this shift in uh, how marijuana was understood, well, or, well, or misunderstood at the time. Um, most notably here, we're talking about the Boggs Act, okay? So 1951, U.S. Congress passed the Boggs Act, which criminalized marijuana possession. And the Boggs Act was basically a lock them up and throw away the key type of law. Um, the sentences were draconian. Like, I, I don't have my notes in front of me, but um, I think on a first offense, you could get 10 years in prison. Um, the fines were in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, third offense, you could be looking at, you know, 30, 40 years in prison. Um, so, you know, Boggs Act, federal legislation. Um, and then there were also states that, uh, that copied uh, the, the federal Boggs Act. At the, so, like, Ohio, for example, passed its version of the Boggs Act, which had some really, really uh, harsh penalties for, uh, for, uh, for uh, drug possession. And the Boggs Act, both the federal and the state versions, we're all based upon this uh, gateway drug theory. Oh, and by the way, as, as I go along, if anyone has any questions, feel free. I, I think this is more fun and it works better if you know, people ask questions, so don't be shy. Oh, and, and also, uh, can everybody uh, hear me okay? All right, good, awesome. I'm, ju I'm just getting echoes up here. I can't tell if people can hear me or not. Plus, it's after lunch, you guys might be sleepy, so, you know, all right. I'll keep it fun, don't worry about it. Um, Okay, so that's the 50s. Okay, now we get in, into the 1960s, okay? All right, what do we all, all know about the 60s? All right, Woodstock and hippies and, you know, uh, great social movements, you know, civil rights movement, free speech, anti-Vietnam War, environmentalism, okay? And what is, what is associated with these, uh, this social revolution is cannabis use. Um, you know, like, uh, I've, I've seen the, the footage from Woodstock you know, and it's a bunch of hippies dancing in the mud, smoking weed, right? You know, I mean, that, I mean, you know, to me, that that's 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 the '60s. You know, when I think about it. Um, but uh, you know, the point is that uh, as the '60s went along, marijuana use became more widespread beyond the counterculture, and in particular, college students. All right. So by the time you get to the 1970s, um, the the states started to back off from those harsh Boggs Act uh, statutes. So, you know, 32, in 1971, 32 states reduced the criminal penalties for marijuana use. Um, I, think, I think this is a good illustration. All right, this was page one of the New York Times, August 6, 1970. Dateline, Hyannisport, Massachusetts. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., second oldest son of the late senator, and Robert Sergeant Shriver III, son of the former U.S. ambassador to France, are scheduled to appear in juvenile court tomorrow on charges of marijuana possession. This story, so basically, the two Kennedy cousins, they were about 16 years old, and they were in Hyannisport, and they got busted with some weed, okay? Well, because they're Kennedys, this was literally front page news. And you know, just when I was doing the research, um, you know, the, the, you know, Walter Cronkite was talking about this on the CBS Evening News at 6:30 p.m. Eastern Time, um, and uh, you know, yeah. So this, I mean, this was a big deal for a couple of uh, days back then. And what you have is you've got you know two aristocrats um, who got busted for weed, and you know, people were like, well, 
you know, we don't want to send little Bobby Jr. and, you know, Shriver III to prison just for a little weed. That's ridiculous. Um, so I put this slide in here to show that, you know, it, it, was, it was okay, quote unquote, okay for the establishment to throw uh, undesirables or the lower class in prison, lock them up and throw away the key. But once it's the, the wealthy white uh, college kids who are getting in trouble with weed, now all of a sudden we have to rethink uh, our approach to marijuana. Um, so that's what happened. And, you know, I, I guess Robert Kennedy Jr. and Shriver III, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of symbolic of all the college kids who were going off to college and smoking weed. And, you know, their parents didn't want them in jail. So um, the drug policy changed in the 70s. And in 1970, U.S. Congress passed the Controlled Substances Act. Is anyone familiar with the act? Um, you guys heard of, you know, you got Schedule One drugs, two, three, four, five. Um, five well, Schedule Five are the most uh, innocuous, and Schedule One are the most serious. So we're all basically uh, familiar with uh, the federal scheduling system. Um, here's the quote from uh, the law. This is what this is. This is the legal definition of Schedule One. All right. The, the findings required for each of the schedules are as follows. Schedule one, the drug or other substance has a high potential for abuse. All right? The drug or other substance has no currently acceptable medical use in treatment in the United States. And number three, there is a lack of accepted safety for use of the drug or other substance under medical supervision. All right? Three-part test, okay? And that's the, that's the statute uh, where you can find that. So... Um, I mean, what do you guys think? All right, let's, let's take it from the top. Who, who thinks marijuana has the high potential for abuse? I don't know. Okay, all right, fine. All right, let's grant you that one. Um, how many think it has no currently acceptable medical use for treatment in the U.S.? Okay, I'm going to disagree with you on that, but thank you. But see, no, yeah, that, that was brave. He's raising his hand. Okay. Um, and then lack of accepted safety for use of the drug under medical supervision. How many think that? Okay, all right, so, all right, so we got, all right, so all right, we, we got a few. No, that's good. This is, this is what makes America great. Um, <laughs> dissent. We don't, we, 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 we're, we're free to disagree. It's cool. Um, see, I would disagree. Um, you know, all right, fine. I'll, I'll grant you that there is a potential for abuse. Okay. But, um, you know, I, I don't believe um, that there is no currently acceptable medical use. Um, you know, like, for example, epilepsy or... Um, uh, PTSD, a number of other uh, conditions. Uh, cannabis can. Uh, there's, a, there's evidence that it, that it can treat it. Um, lack, lack of accepted safety. Um, again, I, I don't think that prong is satisfied either. Um, you know, I, I, I'm told that by people who know a lot more science than I do that it's impossible to overdose on cannabis. That, um, like for example, um, some, some drugs will affect the part of the brain that controls the heartbeat and respiration. And if you were to take one of those drugs and you were to lose consciousness, then your, your, your lungs and heart would stop functioning and, and you'd be dead in a couple minutes. Um, with marijuana, if one were to just ingest a huge uh, quantity of it, I'm told, again, by scientists who know more about this than I do, that the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to have an upset stomach maybe and you're going to take a long nap. Um, so it's not, is, you know, it, 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 the, the, the threat to life isn't as acute with weed as it, as it is with some other drugs. Um, but uh, anyway... Though, that's your that's your uh, legal definition for what it takes to be to get in, into Schedule One. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. But there are a whole host of ways to uh, ingest cannabis. Um, there, there's there's uh, there's just a host of edible products. And, and, and I mean, um, I've seen popcorn, chocolate bars, uh, baked goods, 
um, breath spray, I mean, you name it. So there's that. Um, there's, uh, it can be, manu it can be uh, manufactured into a pill form where you, where you just take a pill. Um, there's, there, there's a lot of, there's topical ointments. I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to ingest cannabis um, that don't involve smoking. But you're right, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're smoking uh, tobacco um, or cannabis, um, yeah, that's not good for you. Does, does that answer your question? All right, great. Okay, so we've got the definition of, of what's a Schedule One. So the issue became, where should marijuana be placed in the schedule system? Okay, you know, you know, where, you know based upon this definition, um, and Schedule Two is a little different, and Schedule Three is a little different, and you can, you know, um, but uh, you know, where where does marijuana go? Well, the the government decided to hand it over to a blue ribbon commission. All right, so they it was created the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse, and it became known as the Schaefer Commission. It had 13 members, uh, Congress appointed four, and the president appointed nine. I, who knows who was president in 1970? Nixon. Yeah, tricky dicky. Right. Richard Milhouse Nixon. You guys watch The Simpsons, you know uh, Milhouse Van Houten, Bart's friend from school? Um, that character is named after Richard Nixon. <laughs> that true fact. See the stuff you learn from The Simpsons? I know, this is awesome. Yeah, so anyway, Richard Milhouse Nixon, president, 69 to 74. Um, I just put this in there because I think it's funny. Um, the 70s was a crazy time. This, is, this, is, this actually really happened. Who knows who the guy on the uh, right is? Elvis. El yes, Elvis came to the White House unannounced. I, the way I heard it, he rang the doorbell. They let him in. Uh, this, is, this was like Kanye before Kanye, right? <laughs> and uh, he asked the president to deputize him as a federal drug enforcement officer which is ironic because Elvis died of a drug overdose a few years after this picture was taken. Um, and I also, somebody else was also telling me that Elvis walked in with a gun. And he, is, is that true? And he gave the gun to Nixon? Wow. Okay, yeah, see, every time I show this slide, I learn more. But yeah, the 70s were a crazy time. Um, oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Oh!